We are here today with Carl Tash, Managing Director and Chief Investment Officer of Starwood Capital Group, uh, where Carl's now spending about 60% of his time in Europe. Uh, Carl's also a member of the Investment Committee for Starwood po uh, Property Trust. Uh, Carl, thank you for talking with us. Thank you, Tom. Happy to be here. I'd like to start uh, our discussion with a big question. Um, mm -hmm. So Starwood Capital Group has something like $51 billion of assets. Yeah. Uh, you invest in a ton of different of real estate sectors. Right. Um, what sectors do you find the most interesting right now and why? And I guess conversely, which ones are you done with and moving away from? Okay, good. Well, we've been, uh, Starwood Capital has for the last 12 to 18 months, I'd say our prime investment theme, particularly in the U.S., has been with uh, buying B, B-plus suburban apartments. Uh, late last year, we did that large transaction with Equity Residential and another one, sim about a third of the size, with Landmark. Today, we own over 90,000 apartments between our last three opportunity funds. And it's really been a strategy focusing on suburban markets. You know, this came up this morning at the at the Zell Lurie program, uh, we really saw that all the rent growth initially was in the urban core, and with that, that's where all the development was going on. Uh, we also, in looking at demographic studies, found that millennials, as they reach those marriage and childbearing years, which today are a little later than previous generations, they're doing the same thing we all did, which is, yes, we lived in the city, but then we moved to the suburbs. And so we've really seen that the demand for suburban apartments has stayed very strong, yet in this cycle, you're really not seeing the level of development going on. Um, in a number of particularly Sunbelt markets today, what we're finding, which is very interesting, and it confirms, confirms our strategy, is that uh, the municipalities really don't, they know their schools are crowded, suburban markets. So what they don't want to do is they'd rather satisfy that demand with single family homes. So it's kind of like what happened with manufactured housing. No one wants it anymore. And the same thing is happening with really, you know, garden apartments or suburban apartments. The markets are saying, no mas, we can't afford to have these two and three bedroom units that are putting a burden in our schools. So we're actually finding that the, some of the suburban areas, particularly more infill areas, which is where we've been focusing, focusing, those areas have much more uh, uh, demand, if you will, strong demand, and we're seeing very good rent growth without anywhere near the risk of supply. So that's kind of been a very simple but overriding theme for where we've been investing money over the last 12 to 18 months. So um, you've, you've the, the, the strategy behind that, just to, to agree, you're looking where the growth and demand was. Right. Um, why BB plus? Is that just what happens to be in suburban markets? Yeah, yeah, it's more the age of the product, right? It's occasionally some stuff in the late 70s, but it typically tends to be anywhere from mid 80s to let's say 2000 uh, built. You know, it's stuff that's 15 to 25 years old, uh, but it has basically all the amenities you need. You know, it has the clubhouse, it has the Wi Fi, it has all the things that you need to appeal to people. They're new enough for that to be there. Uh, but it's not, a lot of people have also focused on what I would say is C product and trying to change who the renter is and upgrading the units. We, we like to stick with, here's the renters that we like. Uh, we also realize that if we do remodels of the units, you get a very high, usually 15 to 20% return on that additional money. So it just makes sense to kind of improve the mouse trap, uh, but stick to the quality of the renter that's already there. It's, it's not our big shift strategy. So um, that was that was talking about the real estate sector, but right. you to a degree alluded to geography, right? So suburban mm -hmm. versus urban. Uh, if we think geographically, because uh, Starwood invest all over the over the world, right? Uh, what geographies are interesting to you? So when you're looking at just the apartments in the U.S., right. are there particular metro areas and suburbs of those areas that you have been focusing on? Um, when you think worldwide, are there particular areas that you uh, have been concentrating on? You've been spending a lot of time in Europe. Right. Um, where are you going? Why are you going there? Well, in the U.S., I'll, you know, I'll finish with the U.S. I, I would say the markets were really not looking at right now are markets that started their recoveries earlier. Uh, you could look at Miami, San Francisco, New York. Those places, it's harder for us, maybe Boston to a degree. Those markets, it's harder for us to see as much you know, broad opportunity. Uh, the markets, uh, whether they're the Nashvilles of the world, even the Atlantas, we own a lot of units in Dallas and Houston. And by the way, we're still interested in Houston. Today, a lot of people have redlined it. If the pricing's right, we'll buy in Houston again. So, uh, and we've been more of a buyer there than a seller over the last couple of years. So uh, we're, you know, we're, the, the 
so we're broadly beyond the kind of three or four gateway markets that started early. I'd say we'd look anywhere else in the top 30 to 50 MSAs uh, in the U.S. But we want to make sure it's a it's a large enough city in an area of a city where the demand should still be there, even if either the economy slows or what will happen, demand for real estate, I'm not sure will remain as great from investors as it is today. So you want to make sure you're investing in markets that aren't only on the edge and they won't, you know, there'll be no buyer for your units, uh, you know, five to 10 years from now or three years from now. So we're pretty careful about that, thinking about how we exit as we get into these markets. Uh, and you also asked so, yeah, about so internationally. Internationally. Internationally, you know, we, we've looked at doing a lot of development, excuse me, not development, uh, acquiring assets in uh, Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, we've been active in Prague, um, in, in the largest cities in Poland. Uh, we've been uh, very busy in Ireland and the UK, though we're doing a little less investing in those markets right now. Again, they recovered first. So we've been really trying to go to the markets where uh, the capital's a little later uh, Spain, we're still active in, uh, mainly for hotels, really not NPLs. Uh, one very fertile market for non-performing loans today is still Italy. They're very early in solving their banking crisis, and they're only now really dealing with, you know, how to kind of clean up our NPLs and volume. So that's still a very attractive market for us. I would say the thing we really try to focus on also is where are we competing and with what kind of money are we competing with? Uh, for instance, if hedge funds have gone to Europe and doing investing in Europe, they tend to use even much higher leverage than any of the rest of us, and they tend to sell very quickly, like six months to a year. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're not looking at you know capital appreciation, just purely IRR driven. Mm -hmm. If we know, let's say that you know one of the active hedge funds is looking at a portfolio that we're also looking at, we'll tend to then you know, walk away from that. And one way we insulate ourselves from that too is trying to do repeat business with sellers where we've done business before, whether it's banks uh, here in the US, financial institutions in Europe, and doing relationship acquisition work. That's always been a hallmark of Barry and Starwood Capital, and we're doing that both in the US and Europe. So the, uh, the countries that you listed, um, that you, in, you're looking at in Europe, uh, what made you go there? So is there embedded growth that you see? Is there a, you mentioned uh, a stock of non-performing loans that you might be able to look right. at. So give me a little bit about what, what factors you look at when you're deciding whether to go to a country. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good question. And I would say we do the same work in Europe that we do in the U.S. You know, you know, you really start out with the premise of here's what that market looks like today. What's that going to look like three to five years from the, today? And that's a combination of, you know, tax policy, uh, you know, attitude towards development. Are there geographic, you know, uh, limitations, be it mountains or seas or whatever? And uh, so you, you really try to understand those issues. And at least from my own personal view, too, I really do like to understand, okay, so what's that area going to look like in three to five years? The contrast is in the U.S., I think we have great market research on all the markets. You know, there's plenty of data and market research on all the markets in the U.S. You go to Europe and you get outside, really, the U.K. and Ireland, the quality of the research, you don't have anywhere near the depth of research that you have. So we really have to make those determinations on cities in Europe based on, you know, our own experiences of what we're seeing on what we've owned already, uh, relationships that we have. Uh, you can really add value by really understanding your markets better there due to the lack that there just is not anywhere near the quality of market research broadly that you have here. So when you're looking at Europe, uh, mm -hmm. and after you've looked at Europe and decided what you <laughs> think about the markets, uh, are there particular sectors in these, each of these countries that you're looking at? Because yes, you were you were in, you're just finding them when you get there. This is a sector I want to be in in say Ireland, right? And so, what are you doing in those markets? I would say you know the main, the primarily we're looking at office okay. in these markets, and again, where is there constraints on supply, and you know how will things look three to five years down the road? Uh, we're also look tend to be looking at retail, uh, and in particular, like in Central and Eastern Europe, it's it's interesting because they really don't even have any modern stock of retail until communism fell. And then some of that, if you will, stock that's now 20 plus years old, there's opportunities to redevelop. Um, and what we're finding too is that we're focusing on office, we're focusing on retail in areas where there's where the population is growing. You know, you want to have that always as your uh, you know, underlying 
help, which is people want to live near this area. They're going through the same things we are in the U.S. You know, the, the younger generation, the millennials, don't want to have real long rides to work and whatever. So you're really trying to say, is this an area that, again, will be as attractive, if not more attractive, three to five years from now? So that's really the litmus test for us, whether that's Prague, Warsaw, um, Milan. Uh, you know, you go through the different cities. Uh, there's also markets where, like in Sweden and Germany, where people tend to rent homes. And then I'm trying to think off the top of my head, there's also markets which are much more home ownership markets. Um, and again, you know, post-communism, they went kind of one way or the other, it seemed. Uh, so we're, we're also trying to pay attention to that. That's been a very tough sector for us to make significant investments in in Europe. Uh, one area where we have been finding some legs is on student accommodation. Mm -hmm. That business you know, is about, I'd say, anywhere from two to three, maybe five years behind the U.S. And, uh, you know, having purpose-built student housing versus people just renting flats from, you know, in a very disorganized way, uh, that's an area that we're seeing, you know, tremendous investment opportunities today. More than, as much as we'd like to buy multifamily in Europe, it's been difficult really to find uh, units and then compete. So much of that, if it's decent product, is done with core returns where we can't really compete. So once you have identified investments, there's a number of different ways that you can actually deploy capital into it, right? Right. Uh, you, you Starwood uh, Capital Group has the luxury, I guess, of being able to be in all sorts of places in the capital stack. Right. Um, how do you think about where you want to be in the capital stack? Uh, what are you tending to do now and why? I mean, you already mentioned acquiring MPLs. Right. Uh, maybe you can tell us a bit. Right. You know, it's funny. The capital stack decision is really uh, driven by, first, the markets we're looking at and how do we want to exploit the opportunity. At this point in the cycle, last time, now I wasn't here in 06, 07, but if we're equivalent, saying today is equivalent to maybe 06, 07, maybe 05, um, most of us in the opportunistic world were doing development to meet our returns, more and more development. At this cycle, you look at what Starwood's doing and there really isn't much development in the Opportunity Fund. We haven't done any development, I believe, for the last couple of years. It's, it's a very insignificant part of what we own in the Opportunity Fund. And that's carried over, because we have a lot of, the overlap's about 60, 70 percent of the investment committee people for the Opportunity Fund, as well as for the mortgage REIT. I serve on both, as do Barry and Jeff Dishner, Chris Graham. Um, what we have found is that uh, we really don't want to uh, do development also in the mortgage rate. You'll see that we've done very little development. We've really redlined back in 2014 doing any more condo development and hotel development in New York City, you know, in the mortgage rate, partly because we just saw there was this huge development profit that even in a city like New York is going to get arbitraged away. Well, how does it get arbitraged away? Too much product gets built. Mm -hmm. And we saw that landscape, so we didn't want to make loans on product where in 2016 or 2017 the buildings would complete. Because um, if there's one thing we've learned from the course transaction we did as well as other transactions that we've done, which is if a developer says, I'm gonna get $2,500 a square foot for a unit, mm -hmm. and the market today is only 2,000 a square foot, and it doesn't quite get to that level, developers are notorious for chasing the markets down but always being late. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've heard the story from our people on the lending side and just what Chorus Bank used to say before they went under, where they say, gee, at this basis, we'd be happy to take the property back. Mm -hmm. Well, unfortunately, what the problem is was when, you know, prices per square foot peak, they gap down, and then the developer is always chasing it down. And what ends up happening is that low basis you have at $1,200 a square foot, mm -hmm. you know, for construction costs, and that's where your last dollar of your loan is, suddenly you're going to be handed the keys, but they're going to hand you the keys when the price is now $1,000 a square foot and going further down. Mm -hmm. So you really want to make sure that you don't find yourself in that position. You, if we're lending to a condo developer, we want to have confidence that they're going to execute at the price that they say and that the market's deep enough to handle that. We're, we're not trying to lend or, uh, you know, or be cute or you know, foreclose on you know, where we're making a loan. So I would say that we're being very cautious on exploiting development, whether that's in the Opportunity Fund or in the mortgage rate. And when you look at investments in Europe or multifamily, suburban multifamily in the U.S., mm -hmm. uh, are you generally taking equity positions? Do you, uh, in in why do you want to be in that position there now? Are you just right. you're just ahead of development enough? 
Yeah, I mean, we we tend to like to be really where, um, like I said before, where you feel like you just have a very high probability of executing the business plan. Um, you know, we're not looking to, you know, upgrade from B units to A units. It's very modest, you know, redevelopments that we do. You see this all the time with value add uh, development. And I would say that's really the shift in this cycle, whether it's in the opportunity fund or in the mortgage REIT, where we are doing primarily loans still, you will see that we're doing business with people uh, either in apartments or office where they have a great reputation for executing value-add transactions, where in the case of office, they're repositioning the asset. Maybe you know it's something they just bought, a 30 or 40% tenant in the building vacated, but the person buying it wants to upgrade the amenities and now reposition the asset for today's market and today's tenants. So that value-add development, or if you will, redevelopment, is a much lower risk strategy where you can get reasonably high returns. And that's really where we're focusing today versus, as I said, in, in the last cycle, we, like most people, were more focused on development. So uh, let's turn then to talking about the, the mortgage REIT, to about Starwood Property Trust, where you're on the investment committee. Uh, it's the country's largest mortgage REIT. Yes. Right? And so... Uh, what's your take on the commercial mortgage business right now? What do you see as the opportunities? What do you see uh, as the challenges? Yeah, it's funny. When we started uh, Starwood Property Trust in 2009, it was a fairly simple strategy, again, because all the banks and insurance companies, all the balance sheet lenders had so many problems with legacy assets that they really weren't in a position to do new lending. So there was really a wide open landscape for Starwood Property Trust starting in 2009. And, uh, you know, where we were able to really fill a, a void and fill a hole for any lending of any kind. Now, there wasn't much in the way of development because there was really no need for development in 09 and 10 and 11. But we uh, really had focused on, you know, existing loans. We also did a decent amount of buying seasoned loans back then. But you were buying them at, you know, 40 cents on the dollar, 50 cents on the dollar because, you know, these banks and insurance companies needed to, you know, clean up their balance sheets. So we could basically, at a new basis, find the loan attractive and, you know, work with the borrower and, you know, see an exit, if you will, a way, a way to exit out of the investment. So where we've evolved to today is what I described just before about really still trying to, for Starwood Property Trust, trying to focus on following our quality borrowers to the markets that they find attractive. So it could be, you know, the better suburbs of Minneapolis or Chicago, um, or maybe even in, you know, downtown Chicago, uh, where the job if you will, have reversed and started to go back into the downtown area again. Uh, we're really today lending, because the, the banks are obviously back and the insurance companies are back. So we we're, we're tend to be in that value add space, you know, very sympathetic to what it is that the developer wants to achieve. We'll get them more proceeds, mm -hmm. probably they can get from an insurance company or a bank. Uh, in other words, we might lend at 70 to 75% LTV, and they can only get an insurance company loan for 50 to 55%. You know, we're much more, more willing to look at that story, either share with them or whatever on the additional CapEx, you know, the good news CapEx. But when the dust settles and they execute that plan over the next 18 to 24 months, we've given them a more flexible and aggressive program. So we're able to use the knowledge that we have and really fill a, a void that still exists today uh, with the you know, banks and insurance companies. Uh, there's opportunities in development, but we're doing that very selectively. Um, you know, because even banks and insurance companies have been backing away from doing much in the way of development lending. So there are selectively opportunities for us today to do financing of development deals. But there's, as you would imagine, lots of bells and whistles today and lots of incentives. That's the other thing is you want to make sure that you're building in incentives for the borrower to execute their business plan. When Starwood Property Trust started, right, right, the REIT was the way to access capital to to, to lend. Right uh, now, it's evolved some. It sounds like so. Yes. As you look down the road, the next five or ten years, where do you see uh, commercial mortgage REITs going? Right, this is a sector that has grown tremendously since right. the Great Recession. Um, you know, where are the challenges that are going to be ahead? How do you see them evolving? Well, I just think where we are at this point in the cycle, it's going to be, you know, very interesting because you have people like us who've had, a, if you will, a book of business that we've had since 2009. And you'll see even in our latest 
you know, earnings report that where roughly our loan to value for the entire loan book is still at around 62%. I think it maybe got as high as 67%, but it's actually been coming down. And you would say, well, how is your loan to value dropping when you're making some loans at 70 to 75% LTV? But what's nice is we have a, actually a mature loan book where the values of the real estate have been going up quite a bit. So now some of that gets refinanced away, but in other cases where it's value add and whatever, the borrower is still doing a lot of work to achieve you know, an increase in value. And if they do that, that initial 70 to 75 percent LTV loan is turning out to be a 60 to 65 percent LTV loan. So we really have an advantage with an aged book, if you will, where we're counting on income from assets where you've already executed the business plan uh, versus if it's a mortgage rate that only got started in the last year or two, they're really dealing with those higher LTV loans and they don't have what I would call an aged book that gives them some cushion for what may be happening here as the cycle starts to, you know, get long in the tooth. So, you know, we're trying to, with our experience, both in the Opportunity Fund and with, uh, the, with the mortgage REIT, really trying to, again, execute strategies that have viability both today and tomorrow, um, and also the loan works in a higher rate environment. Um, and now one way we do that is the borrower has to hedge their interest rate risk. So, you know, one thing I think people forget is if it's a commercial mortgage rate that's structured correctly, you should be able to make more money as rates go up. And we have in our supplement to our earnings, we talk about that and go into that in detail in terms of, you know, the, uh, how our returns and our earnings go up as interest rates go up. That's a real advantage for, you know, a mortgage rate that's got a seasoned book of business, but also works with borrowers who are executing fairly conservative business plans. We're just being more aggressive in the proceeds we'll provide to them for executing. Great. Uh, Carl, thank you very much. This has been extremely interesting. Ah, thank you, Todd.